And we have Mr. Eric McCarson this morning that would like to speak to us. So you'll take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll get on camera over here. So let me ask you all a question. How many of you have ever met a missionary? <laughs> How many of you married a missionary? <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the point of me coming to talk is probably moot this morning. But um, what I wanted to talk to you about is that we are obviously we're having um, missions emphasis this week. We have a mission guide. Most of you should have received one in the mail. But uh, to remind you, the back page of that guide has a breakdown for where our money towards missions goes. Next week, we are having an offering emphasis, and our goal is $350,000. And the first $200,000 goes directly to missions. But the remainder will go towards helping to retire the debt on the building here. And I wanted to give you an update on that. Um, you all been very faithful in your giving. We have, we have raised and spent over $10 million for the land and this building and the campus. And we are only 1.8 million left of paying it off completely. So just so you know, um, our payments are paid up through the month of January. We're that far ahead on things. And that's not to say we can sit back and coast. Um, we need to finish strong, but the, the sooner we pay it off, the sooner that we can now use those funds for other mission related or building related things in this area. You've already seen, we have a lot of new faces. We had a lot of young families coming in for the first time. And that is so refreshing and it is so um, encouraging to us. But um, we just thank you all for the, the base that you all are for us, for your faithfulness, for what you have done for us in missions. We just thank you for that. And I uh, just wanted to mention that. So please use your mission guide this week. I assume you all will. And uh, thank you for your faithfulness. And uh, we, we look forward to reaching our goal next Sunday for our offering. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Sarah. Was, was Joyce on there to make sure? I don't know. Was no. <laughs> Just want to thank you guys again for, for doing that. I've already got a bunch of positive feedback. I don't know if you all signed autographs afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's already a good time. Thank you all for well, Someone uh, asked if we have bobbleheads, but I don't know. Just share bobbleheads. You missed out on the good part when Eric started his uh, spiel. Uh, <laughs> or have you ever married a missionary? <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Uh, all right. Well, it was a good morning and that was great. So really... Our class was well represented. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be next week. Yes, yeah. All right. Uh, student missionary mission trips uh, on Wednesday, November the 9th at 8 p.m., uh, there will be a mission trip interest meeting for the student ministry. Um, they'll discuss two trips that are going on during spring break, sixth through ninth grades are going to Brownsville, and the ninth and twelfth graders are going to Farmington, New Mexico. So uh, this isn't a commitment meeting, but just uh, for the purpose of answering questions about the trips. And guys, we have the men's breakfast, November the 12th. That's going to be at North Richland Hills at 8 o'clock on Saturday. Um, it's going to be in the Campus Fellowship Hall. And the guest speaker will be Dr. Steve Branson. And uh, 
it's always a good time and a good meal. So, uh, is that upstairs, the fellowship hall? The fellowship hall is no, it's on the downstairs and um, on the kind of in the back. The west side. Yeah, right, right. It's Gymnasium. Yeah. Yeah. Um, holiday donations. Um, we'll still be taking up um, goodies for the Operation Christmas Child boxes and also uh, food for the Community Link in Saginaw. And these will be these will be packed by our um, students here. So um, that is all of the announcements that I have. Prayer request uh, for anybody? Um, yes, Wallace. Uh, generally, I met a friend that she went to for a weekend and, you know, she was hoping in this hotel room they had a Bible. It was a Mormon Bible. Was it Marriott? Marriott's had Book of yes. Mormon. I yes. bet you right. It yeah. would have been. But anyway, um, she has been trying to talk with her about, you know, the Lord. And, and it, she asked us to pray for her job to last at least through the end of December. So to ask our group to pray for her was, you know. I, I sent. I sent that out okay. this this and I'll make sure that it gets in our our prayer update. So yeah. you know the lady's name? Yes, uh Janae. Janae. Okay. Will you write that? Janae, yeah. Okay. We asked prayer for Danny Johnson last week that was on his way from Arkansas to right. MD Anderson. Right. Uh he had surgery the eighteenth. No, that was his first surgery. He had surgery this week. This last week, They're, he hopes to be dismissed Monday tomorrow. Okay, he's been, they caught the infection and kept loading him up with antibiotics. So he's, they were afraid they were going to have to do further surgery. They didn't. He didn't stop being so infected. But yeah, that's doing good. That's I told good. him not to hurry them up. Stay there as long as they'll keep him. Yeah, he needs to make sure before he heads out and. Far away again. We had a friend, a long term missionary in Africa that uh, retired same time we did. And uh, yesterday, out playing golf and very unexpectedly just killed over and died. Mm -hmm. Oh, Tim Kearley. Did y'all? Tim, his wife is Charlotte. They were in Africa. Uh, and just very unexpectedly. Wow. Hmm. I'm guessing he's a couple of years younger than I am. About 50. Yeah, something like that. Something like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Actually, I think he was probably, six, I'm, I'm guessing 68. Okay. I mean, I have an update on our granddaughter, Meredith. Uh, her dad has moved her into a, a sober house. Uh, this is the next step of getting her <clears throat> clean. So she has a, <clears throat> a sponsor there that she has to be accountable to. And um, so we're just, uh, you know, he's concerned. His concern is, am I making the right decision? But I do know that he has prayed his little heart out for to to make these decisions for her. And so I just tried to reassure him that hey, God's taking care of her and he's gonna keep her in a safe place. So um, but for her, it's like, will she really accept the help? Yeah. That's the main thing. And that's what we keep praying for is. Yeah. <clears throat> well, an update on 
uh, TV enjoys. TV made an easy transition Tuesday into his new home. Oh, good. I was good. I was talking to Eric this morning, and and he was sharing that it 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 went well. And, yeah. And Joyce he, is good with this also. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she's already in her apartment. Uh huh. Good. Unpacking and <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah. That's good. And she's attending another Sunday school class. Um, oh, well, well, she was. Mm -hmm. She lives near Hewlin. Yeah, the west yeah, side. Yeah, it's town. on the west side of town. Um, so. She's further away now, and she said, "I don't know if I can come back over." This far, we're going to work it out because Grant is one that sings sometimes with the music, and then Cheryl, his wife, works with the children. And she said, "I don't want to really go as early as they have to be there." <laughs> you know, they live their their younger son Grant and her. They're in the same apartment complex. Oh, okay. yeah, which is really good. And yeah. TD's yeah. Uh, TD's home is. Very close by, just within a couple blocks or so. Well, yeah. yeah. No. So, like I said, I don't know anything about that part of town. Yeah, yeah. I had one doctor's that was downtown Fort Worth, and that's right. about it. <laughs> well, I can just say it's on the other side of town. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a ways. It's a um, ways. It's a ways. And especially at five o'clock. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, remember our. Our son. He is at, we're just waiting on his leg to heal, and the doctor said it's going to be a, uh, a little bit longer. We had thought, hope within two weeks, but well, this week it's going to be a little longer before he can have that hip surgery. And he's in a lot of pain. Oh. Some days it's worse than others. So anyway. Yeah. So anyway, we're, we're his uh, sole support right now, pretty much, you know? And so we're just asking God to give us wisdom, lots of wisdom, and uh, to make right decisions. Yeah. And all we can do is just pray as parents and grandparents that we just yeah. pray. That we just that we that one. Well, someone. it's a perfect picture of when you walk away from God as a young person and you just continue to go further and further down. Then when you get down to the end, who's there for you? The mom Absolutely. and dad, and yeah. basically that's where all he is. So, uh, but he has a, a softening about him, and uh, he is appreciating what him and I have done in the past. He hasn't, but he, he does now, so that helps. Oh, um, yeah. such a sweet soul. He does. He does. It's down in there, and uh, mm -hmm. at times he, uh, in the past, of course, said we were out of his life for so long. So. You know, it's, uh, we just minister, minister to him as we can every day, every, every day, every day. Absolutely. Well, let, let me yeah. say a word of prayer and then we'll turn it over to Richard or David, rather. Um, Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for all of the knowledge that we have in our class um, from those who have served you and served you well in the missionary field. Lord, we pray for these that have been mentioned today and ask that you would heal those that are sick and those that have addictions, Lord, these things I ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Tommy. Well, we got a choice to make today. I've got several questions that I'm going to throw out the lesson. And if you choose that you don't want to participate, then we can get out early. <laughs> if, you, if you participate, 
we might be here a while. So he just kind of, and I guess there's some middle ground in there. So uh, the title is The Restoration Promised, but uh, the first thing we want to talk about is good news. You know, uh, we've probably all had some good news at one time or another. We all like to hear good news, whether it's personal, related to family or friends, we like good news. So here's the first question. Have you ever received any good news? <laughs> Anybody want to share? And how did this news impact the rest of your day, the rest of your life? Well, I wasn't sure it was good news when my mom said she wanted to come live with us. <laughs> because I said, Lord, I don't know that I can live in the same house with my mom. And she needs space. I need space. And he took care of that situation because he found us a place, a home. Uh, in another little neighborhood from us where she could have her space and I could have my space. In fact, the first time Tommy went to look at it, he looked at this huge house that was probably three times as big what we were living in. And he goes, there's no way. I said, well, only if the Lord wants us to have it. And I said, it's not our decision. I said, it's my mom is the one making the big, big move. She'd been in her house for 50 years. We'll bring her over. She can look at it. She can make the decision. And we did. We took her over to look at it. And she loved it because she had her own space. And I said, Mom, we can't afford it. She says, well, I can. And I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And I made a believer out of Tommy right there. Uh -huh. He's like, being a banker, he is. Uh -huh. I can't, I can't go there. Yeah. You know, but, but truthfully, uh, that was a blessing to us. Uh, and uh, she lived with us for 10 years. And uh, uh, truly, truly, truly was a blessing. I'm kind of reminded of that with, uh, you know, we lived in our motor home for five and a half years and we uh, traveled and we spent the winters in the valley down near Brownsville and we got very involved at First Baptist Brownsville and we were there for four months and uh, every, every winter, we were there five winters and got to know the pastor and his wife very well and first year we were there. Here we are in a motorhome, and they're living in a travel trailer, much smaller than our motorhome. And uh, they liked it, you know. That's what they wanted to do. They liked that. They liked camping, and so they lived in this travel trailer. Well, the next year we go, and Steve says uh, our housing situation has changed a little bit said, my folks have moved in and my grandmother, you know, he, he's about 60. So his grandmother's approaching a hundred and uh, uh, said, uh, we bought a 5,800 square foot house uh, that eat. It has a place for grandmother. It has a place for uh, mom and dad. And then it has a place for us. And they have four kids and a couple of them had moved back and there's a place for everybody. So he said, we, we've gone from travel trailer to this big house. And, uh, but you know, it was what they needed. And uh, whoever's phone this is, there's a $10 sale that goes off today. <laughs> <laughs> Just got a message. Is that you, Tommy? <laughs> uh, so, uh, I'll share one with you that uh, that was good news and uh, and the impact that it had. You heard a little bit 
maybe this morning uh, related. Uh, when I, uh, I went to the Air Force after I didn't do so well in first year of college. And then when I got out, I, uh, I went to OBU oh. and I said OBU. Oh, I thought you said OBU. No. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> so it was OSU that I flunked out of. So. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I went to OBU and I graduated and uh, I already, uh, I did an internship in my uh, senior year with this accounting firm and they had already offered me a job. And so uh, in Oklahoma, every law, every state has their own rules in the CPA exam and how it's done and administered. It's, there's some general guidelines. Back then there were four parts and uh, took two and a half days to take it. But each state could determine the rules for if you pass this part, didn't pass this part, then you had this long to, to do the rest. And you had to make certain, had to make at least 50 if you wanted to keep any of it. And different states had different rules. In Oklahoma, uh, you had to pass at least one part if you wanted to keep anything and you wanted, and you had to make at least 50 to keep any of your parts. And uh, 75 was passing. And uh, so no, the, the exam is only given in November and May, twice a year, takes two and a half days. Doesn't anymore, but back when I did it, it took two and a half days. And you got four scores, practice, theory, tax, and law, or auditing and law. Practice, theory, auditing, and law. And uh, you got your four scores, you had to make 75 to pass. Well, I was already 10 years older than all of my other rookie colleagues, because I'd spent nine years in the Air Force, plus a year flunking out of college. <laughs> and uh, so I was in my early 30s and they were in their early 20s in this accounting firm and so uh, it was real important for me that I passed the CPA exam. Another thing to to consider is only 15 percent pass the CPA exam on the first try. Uh, it's not like the bar exam or the medical school exams that's how they determine that you really do know what you're talking about. Uh, and uh, so about 15%. So it was very unlikely I was going to pass, but I was determined that I was. And I prepared, you know, uh, and you got another message, Tom. <laughs> but, uh, and I, uh, I did everything I could because I wanted to, passed the exam. And you took the exam the first weekend in November and you got your results the first weekend in February, three months. You know, it's, it's a two and a half day exam and they have to grade them and there are people all over. So, uh, yeah, it takes a while and, uh, so I had been uh, told as, as I prepared that uh, there are some small signals that you can kind of use. Uh, one, the results come out on Monday morning and uh, chances are, if you have a post office box, it'll be put in your post office box on Sunday. So it'll be there on Monday. So if you have a post office box and don't get your mail delivered, you can go to that post office box and it might be there on Sunday. Second thing they told us was if you get an envelope and it's very thin, 
it's an indication that the only thing in there is your results and that you have passed. Because if it's thicker, they will send you not only your results, but the application to take it again. Because <laughs> uh, that's, that's what most people end up doing. And uh, so Sunday morning, I get up, we're ready, getting ready to go to church. I said to Judy, I'm going over to check the post office box and shot for the office. That's where I work. And uh, <clears throat> just to see if it didn't show up today. Because, you know, this is huge for me. And uh, I go over there. There's an envelope. I pull it out. It's a thin envelope. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a pretty good indication right then. And I tore that thing open. and looked practice 75 that's bare minimum but it's passing <laughs> <laughs> theory uh 77 uh audit 75 another bare minimum law 82 Ooh. i had passed <laughs> and on the first try and it was like I said, very important to me. And the guy came in, hit the door about that time to check his mail. And I think he wondered what was going on. Because here's a guy holding an envelope and crying like a baby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, so then I went straight from there and met Judy at church and told her I passed. And you know, then our Sunday school class, you know, because we had Sunday school first and then, then our worship service. And it was just, it was a huge deal. And when you say, how did it impact my day? Well, it was a good day, but literally it's impacted my life uh, because there were so many things I was able to do uh, because of that result of being a CPA. Uh, just a couple of, of brief, quick things. On Monday, I get to the office and uh, first thing, I get a phone call from my major professor at college. She was a, not only an accounting professor, she was a CPA and she got the results in advance. And uh, she said to me, how many points did you waste? <laughs> and I'm thinking, how many points did I waste? She said, yeah, how many did you make above 75? Because that's all that counts. <laughs> and I said, well, I made two 75s, and then I had a 77 and an 82. And so I didn't waste too many points. And so we talked, and she, she was a good influence in my life. And, uh, and then the managing partner of the firm I worked for, we had three offices, and uh, he calls and he said, can you come to the main office? About 45 miles away. And uh, he wanted to congratulate me in person. And he said, uh, David, I think you may know, you may not, nobody in the history of the firm has ever passed <laughs> on the first try. And uh, I got a bonus. <laughs> I got a raise in salary. Oh, wow. They put my name on the letterhead. Uh, now, there's a line. They had the, the partners and then a line. And then there's a couple of us who were CPAs. And I didn't stay long enough to be considered a partner. But, you know, it was a very impactful. Uh, that was good news. And uh, so uh, just thought you might like to to hear what good news can really mean. Uh, in previous sessions in Hosea, we have noted repeated indictments against Israel for their sins, repeated indictments. Hosea pointed out the specific actions of people that moved them away from God. In today's study, 
will begin to see a glimmer of hope based on God's unfailing love and forgiveness. Some good news. Uh, after all of this, we finally have some good news. God is holy and just, and because of his nature, he must judge sin. At the same time, he's compassionate and merciful. He's ready to forgive sinners. Given that sin leads to death and turning to Christ gives life, the wise thing to do is to respond in faith to him. God promises to forgive all who turn to him in repentance. Somebody has Hosea 14, 1 through 3. Henry? Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled in your iniquity. Take words of repentance with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our iniquity and accept what is good, so that we may repay you with praise from our lips. Assyria will not save us. We will not ride on horses, and we will no longer proclaim our gods to the work of our hands. For the fatherless receives compassion in you. All right. So how would we, re we define repent and repentance? Anybody have a good definition for repent, repentance? Turn around. Turn around? Turn away? I like turn away. That uh, you're, you're moving away from it. Anybody else? My thought is that by Hosea's day, there were some people that just needed to convert. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they'd been raised on pagan worship. Yeah. You know, uh, it's interesting. Hosea even suggested the words that Israel might say as they approach God in repentance. He, he was very instructive. Uh, they needed to ask God to forgive them of all their inequity, inequity so they could once again offer acceptable praise to the Lord. The first step in renewing one's relationship with the Lord requires honestly admitting the sins that broke fellowship with him. That is what is good. Hosea did not tell them they needed to perform some religious ceremony. He didn't tell them they needed to perform some sacrifice. Instead, he told them they needed to come clean before God, confess their sin, and seek his forgiveness. There are other instances where sin has come into lives in the Bible. I'm reminded of David in Psalm 51, 15 through 17. Somebody want to look that up real quick? Psalm 51, 15 through 17. And read it. 15 through 17. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a bird offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and, contri and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. How far? 17. That's it. Yeah. So, you know, turn from your wicked ways. You don't need to sacrifice. Just repent and ask God to forgive you. This is what God wanted from them, and it's what he wants from us today when we stumble. Uh, just repent and ask God for repentance. This is the way we reconcile with God. The Apostle John later wrote, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is only when our sinful, unclean lips have been purified that we will be able to offer acceptable praise to the Lord. The second part of their prayer was to be a renunciation of their misplaced faith. They needed to turn from their foolish notions and practices that led them away from God. There were three aspects in renouncing their misplaced faith. First, 
They needed to admit they were wrong to trust in a foreign nation like Assyria. Second, the statement, we will not ride on horses, means they were wrong to trust in their own military to save them. Third, they needed to admit they were wrong to believe that they could trust in their false gods, the work of their own hands to save them. So not Assyria, not their military, not them, not their false gods, but trust in the Lord. The people's admission of these wrongs was an essential part of true repentance. Returning to the Lord means being specific in confessing one's sins to God. Probably most importantly, Israel needed to realize that the only one who would truly show them compassion and help them in time of distress was the Lord. Wasn't Baal, wasn't their false gods, it was the Lord. They also needed to know that no matter how great their sin, had been, God was ready to receive them and forgive them if they would return to him in repentance and faith. How many times have we heard people say, oh, I've done such bad things. I just can't come to church. I can't be a part. God can never forgive, but he can you know, uh, doesn't matter what you've done, God can forgive, and he will. Why do people refuse to admit their wrongdoing, even when they know what they did was wrong? That's a problem. It's just very difficult. I think it's our human nature. Uh, we just don't want to admit when we've done something wrong. All right, who has Hosea 14, four through seven? I will heal, heal their apostasy. I will freely love them for my anger will have turned from him. I, I will like the do to, like the do to Israel. He will blossom like the lily and take root like the cedars of Lebanon. His new branches will spread and his splendor will be like the olive tree. His fragrance like the forest of Lebanon. The people will return and live beneath his shade. They will grow grain and blossom like the wine. Fine. His renown will be like the wine of Lebanon. Okay. There's a couple of words in there that are, are really not exactly how I might have said them, but that's how they said them. Yeah. In the, uh, yeah. uh, God promised to heal their apostasy. Literally heal its turning. Their apostasy needed God's intervention to correct. Ephraim thought it could find healing from Assyria or that it could save itself. Hosea's message was that God alone could save them. Apart from God's mercy and grace, they were incapable of returning to him. When the people returned to the Lord, they would be able to enjoy the fullness of his covenant love for them. This all happened because of God's grace. They were incapable of doing anything themselves to earn it. God also said, my anger will have turned from them. This statement also echoes the words of David. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. He will not always accuse us or be angry forever. And, you know, let's face it, David, uh, great king, but he sure did some things that would cause the Lord's anger. Uh, but he asked for forgiveness, uh, just like we're taught here. It's also interesting for a country guy from southwest Oklahoma. Uh, he used agricultural images to describe his restoration. First, do. The moisture that forms into water droplets in the cool of the night. The most important resource in Israel was water. Dew was the most essential during the dry summer season. 
Without it, people would have suffered greatly, and its absence could be attributed to God's judgment. Consequently, the presence of dew was a symbol of God's blessing and provision. It represented refreshment from him. Uh, my brother-in-law in southwest Oklahoma, uh, one of the way he's a farmer, and you know, farmers the last 20, 30 years haven't made much money. But the way he's made money, he has a hay baling business. And uh, he bales hay. And a lot of times you bale hay at night because you got your farm work to do during the day. Well, he bales hay until a certain point in the night when the dew comes up. And when there's enough dew, you got to quit baling because the, that'll make the hay too wet. And it won't keep. You need that hay to be fairly dry uh, so that you can store it. So dew, very important. Uh, when God healed their apostasy, he would be like dew to them. The second picture is the blossoming flower. The Hebrew word lily can be translated as a variety of flowers. Whatever the flowers, the meaning is clear. Without water, there is no flower. But when the Lord is Israel's due, Israel would be a beautiful flower drawing its nourishment from him. Not only would Israel be like a beautiful flower, it would have deep roots like the cedars of Lebanon. The writers of the Old Testament sometimes wrote of the cedars of Lebanon as the first among trees. They described them as strong, durable, high, graceful, beautiful, fragrant, and spreading wide. They were the trees in which eagles made their nests and perched in them. Cedar would also play a role in purification rites. Kings used it as a symbol of majesty and wealth. The cedars of Lebanon symbolized growth and strength. In verse 6, the Lord continued his agricultural metaphors. New branches that spread means the nation would thrive and increase like budding trees in the spring. What we need to understand is that these would be new branches springing forth from trees that appeared to be dead from a long winter. Y'all remember we're coming up on winter. Not last winter, but the winter before in February, the 500 year storm, they called it, where we were below zero for three, four days. We were below freezing for an entire week. Uh, I mean, it was cold. And for an extended period of time, you know, I, I, I don't think I've ever had that many cold days in a row. Well, we have two trees in our front yard. And one of those trees didn't seem to be very affected by that. The other tree, we thought it was dead. Well, this past spring, we had roots come out. And uh, just this past week, we got a guy in there and uh, he cut out all the dead limbs. Not much of that tree left. Uh, it's, uh, but next spring, um, I'm thinking there'll be even more shoots that sprout, sp sprout out, sprout out, come out, uh, it's sprout. So fast because it's still got all those roots down there that fed the big tree. Yeah, and it doesn't have all that dead stuff there anymore. Uh, so we're hopeful uh, that it will be a picture of renewed life uh, when that tree uh, comes back and is as full as the one right next to it. Israel had become spiritually dormant and unproductive when it turned away from the Lord. But their covenant God was not going to allow their demise to be their end. 
Also, Israel's splendor would be like that of the olive tree. Anyone know how long an olive tree can live and be productive? Hmm? Hundreds of years. Maybe even thousands. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we yeah. saw we saw a tree that was two thousand. In the Garden of Gethsemane, yeah. they yeah. show yeah. a tree they think is two thousand. Yeah, they 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 can live and produce for a long, long time. And olives were and are an essential part of Israel's life. Uh, they served as food, fuel, medicine. They're used for religious and royal anointing. Above all, the olive tree was a symbol of longevity, blessing, prosperity, and holiness. All of these words describe what the Lord was promising for Israel's future. Also, Israel's fragrance would be like the fragrance of Lebanon. People have appreciated the fragrance of cedar. What do we make chests out of? What do you call the chest? Cedar chest. And some people, we don't have one, but I know of people that have their closets lined with cedar. Yeah, our, our motorhome had a had a uh, cedar-lined cedar closet. Uh, if Israel had an odorous stench of death removed and replaced with a pleasant aroma, wouldn't the people recognize that? The same image where we keep harking back to, to different things that happened in the Bible, that same image can be found in the Song of Solomon where the groom describes the pleasant fragrance of the bride. Israel would once again bring pleasure to the Lord, saying the people will, will return assumes they would be displaced. This refers to their time in exile. It's a promise that their captivity would not last forever. The Lord promised four things would happen when they returned. First, they would live beneath his shade. This implies a nation that would be a refreshing, protective shelter. Just as the Lord is for those who seek him, they would be a protective shade. Second, they will grow grain. The work of their hands would be productive. They will be a source of sustenance and life for others. Third, they would blossom like the vine, giving joy to others like the fruit of the vine. The fertility they would enjoy would make them wonder how they could have rejected the Lord and turned to Baal. Finally, Fourth, that Israel's renown would be like the wine of Lebanon. I'm not a uh, wine connoisseur, uh, so uh, I do like grapes, but I'm, I don't like wine. Grape jelly. Uh, grape jelly, grape juice. Uh, my favorite is diet cran grape, uh, and it's uh, 15 calories per serving. So I love diet cran grape. You can buy it at Walmart, you can buy it at Kroger. Uh, but evidently, uh, the wine of Lebanon uh, was renowned throughout the Middle East there. Uh, Old Testament doesn't speak of the wine of Lebanon anywhere else, but it was renowned throughout the ancient Near East. Israel would be a blessing to the nations by showing them what happens when God's people faithfully serve him. As with many other places, we look back to other times and places in the Old Testament and see where this echoes what happens when Moses said Israel's faithful obedience would show the nations how great their God is. 
Israel would once again display how great their God was, just as they did in Moses' day. How should God's promise of love and forgiveness motivate us to repent and turn to him? Anybody have any thoughts? I have to keep going back to the cedar tree. Yeah. Uh, originally not from Texas. I had not heard of mountain cedar. Yeah. <laughs> until I moved here. <laughs> the outreaches of mountain cedar is amazing. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, uh, when we know of the, lo the love that God has for us and what he does for us, how he will forgive us, that should motivate us to want to be with him and confess and repent and turn to him. All right, last passage. Who has eight and nine? Ephraim, why should I have anything more to do with idols? It is I who answer and watch over him. I'm like a flourishing pine tree. Your fruit comes from me. But whoever is wise, understand these things. And whoever is insightful, recognize them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. Okay, God concluded his message with a rhetorical question suggesting he has said all he wants to say about Israel's false gods. Nothing more to say. God was done talking about them. God was watching Israel to see what their response to him would be. And the Lord used the metaphor of a pine tree to describe himself. The evergreen was a symbol of royalty, fertility, and divinity. Israel had attributed these characteristics to Baal, but the only one who truly has these attributes is the Lord. You might say God told them they had barked up the wrong tree. <laughs> Hosea's final exhortation was a wisdom saying, using a common motive of choosing between two ways. The person who was the wise would recognize that the ways of the Lord are right, and those who were righteous would walk in them. Walking the ways of the Lord means submitting to him as Lord. Life and satisfaction come from faith in God and humble obedience to him. In contrast, those who live in rebellion against God will stumble and be consumed by their rebellious ways. So we've talked about repentance. How would you say repentance is an act of wisdom or an expression of faith? Anybody have any thoughts? How is it an act of wisdom or an expression of faith? If you're going to repent, you have to recognize, you know, the mistakes that you've made. You have to be smart enough, have enough wisdom to recognize those mistakes. And you have to have faith that he'll do what he says he'll do and forgive you. Tommy, that reminds me of something I heard in a sermon one time. It said it's a story, I don't know whether it's true or not, that this man was. Uh, a judge or somebody was going to a prison and was going to commute a sentence of somebody, you know, and said, as he kind of went down the line meeting the guys or whatever, they say, oh, listen, I didn't do what I did, you know, but so you've got to let me go, you know, you've got to let me go. And he came to one and he said, don't even shake my hand. He said, I'm totally guilty of all that, I, that I'm here for. And I don't deserve to be let go. That's the one he let go. Yeah. That's not quite how I remember. It. That's the general picture. <laughs> like Tommy said, you have to 
admit you have sin before you can be forgiven of it. Yeah. Well, how many times have we watched uh, uh, court proceedings and the, the, at the end, the judge will say you, you to the guilty person, you've shown absolutely no remorse over what you've done. Yeah. Those are the ones I usually throw the book at. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. used to. So does anybody, and I'm not asking for a show of hands or an answer, but <laughs> does anybody know anybody that needs to repent? <laughs> and I'd say we probably all know someone. They may not have done horrible things, but we all know we're all sinners and we know people who don't know the Lord. So those people need to repent and uh, come to know who the Lord is. So this week, I'll just close and, and ask you to think about ways that you can share with that person. Will? From time to time, we all need to repent. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the time. You know, yeah. In a sense, there's macro and micro. Yeah. Now, you know, Israel needed macro repentance. I mean, they were committing idolatry. They were worshiping idols. They were committing immorality. All the people and the whole nation needed major repentance, complete U-turn of life. But all of us as Christians have micro repentance that we need to do from day to day and confess our sins to the Lord. Yeah, good. All right. Anybody else have anything they want to add? I'm not sure why. I'll, I'll just tell this real quick. Uh, why it reminded me. But uh, I had an accident uh, several years ago. I was driving from our learning center back to the office. And there's kind of a back way you can go. And there's a red light on one place. Well, I stopped at the red light. And I proceeded through. and uh, when it started, when it turned green, but there was this pickup that didn't stop for the red, and he just cramped, ran me and turned my car around and uh, wasn't hurt because I had a big old Buick. Uh, and uh, two months later, we both got summoned to go to court. Two months later, we're in court, and uh, I get there and there's like 57 items on the docket and we're number 41. So I'm going to be sitting there a while and I'm sitting there through one through 40. Every time the judge asked the defendant what happened, give me your side of the story, tell me. And I had been taught. I don't, I hadn't ended up in court very often, thankfully, but I'd always been taught and I saw on TV that you wore a suit when you go to court. Well, I was the only guy in a suit besides the lawyers. <laughs> the judge had on his robe oh. and the lawyers up front, they had, they had uh, on suits, but I was the only guy in the courtroom other than those lawyers that had on a suit. So number 41 is my case versus this guy. The other guy was the defendant because they had been the one issued a ticket. But the judge asked me what happened. Uh, and I think it was because I had a suit on. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, if you, if you ever want to learn anything about law, go to a courtroom, just sit there sometimes. Very, very interesting. All right. Uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll go. Father, we uh, do thank you that we can study your word and thank you for your lesson today. And just ask that uh, you would show each of us where we need to confess our sins. And uh, as uh, Mark has said, you know, it may not, they may not be big ones, they may be micro, but. Uh, but we still need to confess. And uh, so we just thank you that you're a forgiving God and uh, that uh, if we do repent, uh, you'll forgive us. 
and that we would always seek to honor you as our Savior and Lord. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. I apologize if this was discussed before I got in here, but uh, Steve was wanting us to get together as a class this week for prayer together for our missionaries. So um, what I'm wondering, was this discussed? No, not about you. We didn't yeah. bring it up. No, okay. it's my fault. Okay. I'm bad. <laughs> uh, well, we pissed. <laughs> that being said, we are open for suggestions as to when everyone maybe could get together for maybe uh, a lunch or early afternoon or just. Uh, even at someone's house to pray for our missionaries this this week. Uh, if we have any volunteers, <laughs> uh, or or go somewhere for lunch. Uh, there's a there's a great place uh, that has a lot of room, and they have like a little uh, separate room. Uh, the barbecue place that's down. Uh, What's it called? Brent Barn or something like that. Um, um, I'm sorry. No, it's it's off of uh, I-35 and Western Center. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, Behind Barnes and restaurant. all that in there. Yeah. Um, Shady Oaks. Shady Oaks. Barbecue. Shady Oaks. Yeah. If we wanted to uh, maybe have uh, a lunch. Uh, I'm always we, open we, for lunch. I think we barbecue. <laughs> so, uh, if we could uh, pick a day that would work for everyone, then maybe we could uh, meet about twelve thirty. I'm just throwing this out there, guys. I'm like, I think know, that's a good help idea. Whatever. Yeah. So, you know, we can't eight, on Wednesday. You know, William is having two tests at Scott and Baylor on Wednesday at 12 30. Okay, so the other that day, thing, like, we had one whole week last week, uh -huh. not a blood test or doctor's uh -huh. appointment. Oh well, how do things look on Thursday for you all? Oh, the rest of the week's open. Uh, you you know, know, uh, Thursday, you're open on Thursday? I'm not, but you need to. And I'll just tell you all this so you, you can be praying for me. Uh, I've been asked to serve as a trustee on Southern Baptist of Texas Foundation. And we have a first meeting on Thursday. So, uh, okay. can we go Tuesday? Would Tuesday, Tuesday work? would work for us. Tuesday's election day. Oh, that's, oh, that's right. right. Friday. I've already voted. We've already voted. Yeah, yeah, we have two. We have voting right here for Tuesday. We could meet on Tuesday and pray if everybody's voted already. Yeah. We, could also, <laughs> we could also pray for the election. <laughs> Tuesday at twelve thirty. I think we, I got it. Tuesday at twelve thirty. I'm I'm in. Everybody, okay. Going on Red Barn. Uh, Shady yeah. Oaks. Shady, Shady, Shady Oaks, Oaks. Oaks. Oh. barbecue. It's there yeah. in yeah. North Richmond Hills. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. okay, that's not the one by the side behind the Sados. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. Okay, we went oh. to one that was on the other side of Western Center. That that's that's the one that's we're Ruby's. talking about. That's no, no, that's about Ruby's. Ruby's. Yeah, okay. where you served yourself. I would have been on the wrong side of Western Center. <laughs> <laughs> other side. Oh, other side. Other side. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's back so, there behind Bronze. So you're gonna, yeah. Shady yeah. Oaks Park. Park. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, reservation. Yes, I, I will. Yes. Okay, I so, are we on the show with 30 